as the American boxer Joe Lewis made his way to the ring in June of 1938 to fight the German Max Schmeling, the whole world was listening. And she's about to start with this Yankee Stadium packed to the doors. There isn't an empty seat. Joe Lewis in his car, passing. The pressure on Lewis was immense. This was the most listened to event in broadcasting history. The 24-year-old fighter carried the hopes and dreams of America into the ring with him that night. At stake was much more than just the heavyweight championship of the world. Joe Lewis was not just fighting another boxer, he was taking on the Nazi regime. It's probably the most politicized sporting event in the history of sport. In an era in which blacks lived in fear, Joe Lewis was not only fighting for his country that night, he was also fighting for his race. Joe Lewis, if he went to the American South, he couldn't sit at a soda counter. He'd have to get to the back of the bus. If you were black in the 1930s, you were still a very much a second-class citizen. And so the fact that he was our representative against this fascist, racist regime was more than a bit ironic. But there was also a more personal battle going on. Lewis knew that working against him was a black American boxer who had gone over to the other side. Former heavyweight champion of the world, Jack Johnson, was advising the German camp on Lewis's weaknesses in the ring. Certainly Jack Johnson was probably the greatest defensive fighter who ever lived. Um, so if anybody could pick out flaws in a fighter, Jack Johnson could do it. What happened next would be called the fight of the century with good reason. Inside the ring, it was a boxing match charged with bitter rivalry and hatred. Outside the ring, it was the start of a historic struggle that would reach far beyond boxing. This wasn't a fight of the century. This was a fight for the world. This is the story of two very different black boxers and the passion that drove them. A passion that would change not only the face of boxing, but of America itself. Our story begins at the turn of the century. Jack Johnson was born into a forgotten America, one in which slavery had only recently been abolished. He became involved in boxing at an early age, but not the kind of boxing we recognize today as a modern sport. In the American South, black children would fight for the amusement of the white social elite. The promoter would gather up uh, four, six, eight, um, black American kids and blindfold them and put them in, in the center ring and um, let them swing at each other and basically the last guy standing would be the winner. This brutal ritual was known as the Battle Royale. A Battle Royale was an absolute demonstration kind of of the inferiority of, of African Americans in, in the United States or in sports. The object was an athletic competition. The object was to laugh, to feel better than the people, the race represented in that ring. For Jack Johnson, the horror of the Battle Royale became a means to an end. To survive those terrifying blindfolded bouts, he trained himself to become a superb defensive fighter. But at the turn of the century, boxing was a new and segregated sport, so at first Johnson's opportunities were limited. The title of heavyweight champion of the world was only a few years old yet it already held a symbolic importance in a racially divided America. The white man was the heavyweight champion because he epitomized, personified, the strongest man in the world. And that was not going to be a black man. Despite the odds stacked against him, Jack Johnson emerged from the battle royale determined to become a professional fighter. Even though he could only fight whites in semi-illegal contests, that put him at great risk. Jack Johnson had a contempt for 
for white people. He, 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 f he felt from the time he was a kid that he was equal to anybody. And um, color should not make any difference. It was as if Johnson had been born at the wrong time and the wrong place. Convinced of his ability and remarkably fearless, he refused to be intimidated by the way the fight game was organized against him. Was he scarred from his background? I'm sure he was scarred from his background. But he wasn't humbled by his background. I mean, he, he had this rebellious spirit. You know, th that's a death sentence in the South. For eight years, Johnson fought all comers. But by 1908, he had beaten every fighter willing to face him. Jack Johnson learned his craft. He fought some of the toughest fighters in America. Uh, he won the Black Heavyweight Championship. Then he started to get the idea that, you know, maybe he'd like to be heavyweight champion of the world. America simply could not accept the idea of a black contender fighting for the heavyweight title. But Johnson saw his chance when Tommy Burns, the white champion, went abroad on tour. Johnson pursued Burns to the other side of the world and challenged him in Australia. Here's Tommy Burns getting himself into the best shape of his entire career. Tommy knows that this is going to be the fight of his life. The fight was set to take place in Sydney on Boxing Day 1908. For the then vast sum of $30,000, Tommy Burns finally agreed to fight Jack Johnson. The fight was a sellout. A crowd of 20,000 people the press and their cameras gathered to watch the first ever championship fight between black and white. Johnson clenches with Tommy and smiles to ringsiders. Burns looks almost like a little boy compared to the 212 pound challenger. The opening rounds were a succession of clinches with few punches thrown. Although he held back from taking the fight to his white opponent, at six foot two inches, Johnson towered above Burns and would use his height to full advantage. To many in the crowd, it was obvious that Johnson was merely toying with the champion, goading him on until the tiring Burns could no longer compete. Here in round five, Johnson has no trouble in tying his man up. He was a very good fighter, master defensive fighter, totally in control in the ring. As we come to the end of round five, it's apparent that Burns is almost at an insurmountable disadvantage against this magnificent fighting machine, Jack Johnson. He was a great counter puncher. He was a great strategist. And he could also punch. As well as dominating his opponent physically, Johnson enjoyed taunting his rival. Here in round eight, Johnson rushes in and holds Burns as he talks to ringside, laughing all the time. If he tries to humiliate a white fighter, they're going to lose control. And boxing's all about control. Johnson calmly looks down at Tommy, talks to the champion, taunting him. He wants Burns, as well as everyone, to know that this is no fight, this is a picnic. Come on, little Tommy, is that the best you have? Come on, Tommy, your mother can hit harder than that. Come on, Tommy, hit me. Show him what you have, and then whop, 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 hit him. A good right uppercut. Another ripping right uppercut by Johnson. Uppercut, hooks, all punishing blows. This tension builds up and it builds up and Jack Johnson starts hitting him and hurting him. And then if you see the films of it, then suddenly, boom, the films go dead. Jack Johnson wins. It's over. The end of the white man's domination of the heavyweight championship. Having flaunted his physical superiority before the world and its cameras, Johnson was as flamboyant outside the ring as he was inside it. Not content with flouting the dictates of polite society, Johnson also had a fondness for white women, and even went as far as marrying one, Etta Durea Johnson. This was something that a horrified America felt added insult to injury. Johnson's lifestyle, he lived like he drove fast fast pedal to the metal all the time this was a black man who didn't know his place one who raced cars gambled and refused to conform to the rules of white society Johnson and his exploits terrified the American establishment and beating him became a national priority 
The press and the public united in a search to find any white fighter capable of beating him. Desperate to find a snappy slogan, one newspaper coined the phrase, the great white hope. It turned into a farcical thing because almost anybody who was white and who was big and who had a modicum of talent would be labeled the great white hope. By 1910, the search for the great white hope featured regularly in the national press. One after another, retired champions were urged back into the ring to defend the honor of their country and their race. Jack London, the novelist who was then a boxing writer as well, sort of sounded a clarion call for Jim Jeffries, who had retired in 1905, to come back and wipe that golden smile off the face of Jack Johnson. Jim Jeffries had once been a great fighter, a heavyweight champion of the world who had exchanged his boxing gloves for the good life. The pressure on Jim Jeffries was enormous. Jim, come off the alfalfa farm. America needs you. It's up to you, Jeff. It's up to you. You have to come back. Finally, after two years of searching for a contender, America had found their man. Jeffries finally relented, and he was clear. I mean, it had a lot to do with money, the reason he came back. But he was clear on why he, the, the, the psychological reason. I'm coming, he said, I'm coming back to prove that a white man's superior to a Negro. And uh, suddenly Jim Jeffries became the original great white hope, with all the hopes and dreams of the white race resting clearly on his shoulders. And the white David captured the public imagination long before either man stepped into the ring and the promoters realized that they had managed to pull off the biggest box office draw that boxing had ever known with nearly a million dollars at stake boxing had evolved from a seedy fight game into a ruthless business the fight of the century was set to be held in Reno Nevada on the 4th of July Never before had a sporting event been such a focus of public interest. The championship battle polarized the nation, dividing not just black from white, but boxing fans from the morally outraged who didn't think the fight should go ahead. What you had on that week before the July 4th, 1910 fight was an influx of thousands upon thousands of people into Reno, Nevada, and everyone from pickpockets and drunks and gamblers to corporate leaders and politicians to celebrities. Everybody who was anybody and some people who weren't was there. Normally a city of 15,000 people, Reno doubled in size on that 4th of July. On the day of the contest, armed police patrolled the gates of the new specially built amphitheater to ensure that no spectators were carrying firearms. Johnson received numerous death threats before the fight, but showed no signs of fear. Just to step inside of a boxing ring takes courage. And then to know that virtually every person there hates you, maybe hates you enough to kill you, to assassinate you. And then to fight and to have this look on your face as if you're out on a Sunday picnic and you don't have a care in the world, the action is tentative, cautious. Two champions, one old and coaxed out of retirement, are claimed as the great white hope. As the fight began in the full afternoon sun, expectations were high among the mainly white crowd, as Jeffries looked stronger than ever. Having never lost a fight, he looked every inch the great white hope. The fight was scheduled to last 45 rounds, but by the end of the sixth, Jeffries was showing signs of his age. Jeffries is beginning to show frustration. Each time he launches an attack, Johnson quickly stifles it. After more than a year's build-up, what had been billed as the battle of the century was fast becoming an infuriating anti-climax. And it's soon becoming evident that this is one-sided. By round 14, only Jeffrey's legendary ability to absorb punishment was keeping him standing. A vicious overcoat and three stinging lips. Jeffrey's gone down! He knocks Jim Jeffries down for the first time. And as Jeffries gets up, he pummels him, knocks him down again. And the crowd starts hollering for the referee, Tex Rickard, to stop the fight. They did not want to see their man knocked out. 
but he allows it to go on for a third time. And the last scene is a very sad one. Jeffrey's on his haunches, right arm over the ropes, and his cornerman jumping in the ring. It's all over. Basically, the white hope crusade, and that's the right word, is over. Jim Jeffries, the carrier of the banner, is a beaten man. The fight was over, except for white America, the wrong man had won. Across the country, interracial violence flared. There were deaths, there were lynchings, there were slashings, and if white America was scared of Jack Johnson, Prior to the Jeffries fight, it was even more scared to him now. The great white hope had gone down in flames. And look what happened as a result. Violence, bedlam. It was Amer America's worst nightmare. It just turned even worse. Soon after his victory, he opened a nightclub in Chicago, which he called the Cafe Champion. But with his bar, his fame, and sporting lifestyle, Johnson had become the emperor of a dubious underworld of hustlers, prostitutes, drunks, and gamblers. And he began to lose the control that he craved both in and out of the ring. Desperate to find something incriminating, the Bureau of Investigation, which would later become known as the FBI, had Johnson under 24-hour surveillance. The government was hell-bent on getting a conviction of Jack Johnson. They had, uh, they had a huge file on him. And they got him eventually on a, what was a technical violation of the Mann Act. The Mann Act was set up to counter large-scale prostitution rackets, and it prohibited the transportation of women across state lines for what it called immoral purposes. The investigators realized that they had found Johnson's weakness. While externally his lifestyle betrayed little sign of change, the walls were beginning to close in on Johnson. What was it like to be Jack Johnson at this time? The pressures, the internal, external pressures on him. This is a guy who's facing some hard times. After five years on top of the world, Johnson had finally been defeated by the authorities and was convicted under the Mann Act. To avoid prison, he fled the country. Out of it came one lasting effect. From that day in 1915, for the next two decades, the black man became invisible again. The years after World War I saw boxing rise to become the most popular sport in the world. Jack Dempsey, heavyweight champion from 1919 to 1926, reigned supreme. Dempsey was boxing's first millionaire playboy, an all-American champion who personified a new era. He and his managers were united in the belief that he should not fight blacks. The last thing America needed or wanted was another Jack Johnson. Black fighters, no matter how good, were effectively shut out of the heavyweight division. But as bust followed boom, America had to deal with economic depression. And one effect was that blacks began moving out of the rural south and up to the urban north in large numbers in search of employment and opportunity. Many of these migrants found work on the factory assembly lines of cities like Detroit for $5 a day. Among the new city dwellers were a family called Lewis and their son, Joe. There was a kid out of Detroit named Joseph Lewis Barrow. And because somebody forgot his name in the ring, he just became Joe Lewis. I think Joe Lewis always carried the seeds of greatness within him. You have to, you, you had to see him fight to understand this. I had the opportunity to be around Joe Lewis. I had the opportunity to be traveling in his presence. And when you said Joe Lewis, everybody knew who Joe Lewis was. 
Young Joe Lewis was spotted by a well-connected black manager named John Roxborough, who believed his man could be the first black man in 25 years to go all the way to the top. Joe, I'm satisfied you're going to be the next heavyweight champion of the world. I hope so. Well, Joe, as your manager, I'm going to do everything possible to get you a chance to fight for the championship. Thank you. White America wasn't ready, particularly as a result of the uh, actions of Jack Johnson, um, to have a black man uh, be the reigning heavyweight champion of the world. So to that extent, uh, it was quite a, a challenge for them to determine how they were to get my father, uh, who grew up in the ghettos, if you will, of Detroit, uh, to the pinnacle of his profession. The interesting point about Lewis is within the first year of his career, he was fighting top 10 heavyweights, and he acquitted himself time after time with knockout after knockout after knockout after knockout. The left hook that he would hit you with was so short, you couldn't see it. Bang! And the guy was already on his way down and out when the right came. The power in his punches, getting the leverage that he used to get in his punches, this was peculiar to Joe Lewis and Joe Lewis only. During the course of 1935, Lewis rose steadily through the ranks of the heavyweight division. There was also a growing following behind the shy black boxer, as America likes nothing better than a winner. Once he began to win, a lot of the, American, the white American public began to swing his way. Um, because he was, quote, their kind of black guy. Joe Lewis was fast becoming one of America's first black media stars. Well, he was just, he was, he was our hero. He was our everything. Every time Joe would have a fight, you could walk down the street in the summertime and hear the fight. Everybody had on their radio, had a radio turned up. But there was a cloud on the horizon for Joe Lewis. After more than 15 years out of the spotlight, Jack Johnson was back on the scene and made an approach to the Lewis camp. Very few people, once they're at the center, the epicenter of, of, of culture or sport, ever want to get out. And with Joe Lewis, I think he saw the chance. Here we have another great black champion. Well, why don't I move back into that scene? You know, maybe I can pretend like I'm trading. Maybe I can get sports writers to talk about who's better, Lewis or... But the Lewis camp saying, no, 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 we don't want any of that. Get, get that cat out of here. It was a decision they would live to regret. Before Lewis could fight for the title, he would have to defeat another European, a German former world champion named Max Schmeling. Max was perceived to be an ideal opponent for young Joe Lewis. Um, it wasn't expected that Joe Lewis would have much trouble with him. Max could have been considered yet another step on the Joe Lewis ladder of former champions. World champion, arrives for his comeback fight with Brown Bomber Joe Lewis and seen quite confident. Max, what, what makes you think that uh, you can lick Lewis when the others couldn't? Well, I wouldn't make the same mistakes that other fellow made. But what the world didn't know was that Schmeling was using a brand new technique to analyze his opponent's weaknesses. Schmeling was one of the few guys to ever look at films. And he sat home in Germany and he looked at films of Lewis. Schmeling and his trainer were looking for a flaw in Lewis's style, and the vital piece of information they sought came from an unlikely source. Jack Johnson, who had been spurned by Lewis's camp, decided he would use his expertise to help the German fighter instead. Certainly Jack Johnson was probably the greatest defensive fighter who ever lived. Um, so if anybody could pick out flaws in a fighter, Jack Johnson could do it. Joe Lewis had an Achilles heel, and it would take Johnson to point it out. Jack Johnson is extremely jealous uh, of Joe Lewis. He feels, even at age 58, that he should be the heavyweight champion of the world. And ironically, he is the one who sort of brings out this small defect. Max Schmeling now had a secret weapon. And what it was, 
that when Lewis threw his right hand, he always dropped his left. It's a habit. It's a bad habit. And you go to any gym, and the first thing I'll tell you is keep your left hand, if you're right-handed fighter, keep your left hand up. But he'd throw the punch, and this would go down. I mean, it was wide open for him. At New York's Yankee Stadium on the 19th of June, 1936, Joe Lewis, the Brown Bomber, stepped into the ring with Max Schmeling. It was one of the most memorable bouts in boxing history. Undefeated in 28 fights, Lewis was 10 to 1 on to win. Few expected Schmeling to leave the ring on his feet. For the first three rounds, Schmeling kept his distance and waited for Lewis to drop his guard. Schmeling delivered a right hand from hell. A heavyweight is most vulnerable in the early moments of a fight. Because he's not warmed up yet. His body's just not warmed up yet. And his, his central nervous system is not adjusted to taking a, a good punch. So when he's hit on the chin early in a fight, with a devastating straight right hand right on, the, on his chin and his jaw, never came out of that, really. Lewis goes down. The referee, Arthur Donovan, signals Max to go to a neutral corner. Joe's up on his feet, but it's all Max here in round four. As the German got the upper hand, some of the crowd openly started cheering him. After the fourth round, you can see Max's confidence grow. You can see the, the crowd moving over to Max. He takes more chances. He puts together more combinations. You can hear the crowd is now with Schmeling very quickly. Max hears the crowd chanting, kill him, kill him. And he suddenly realizes they're talking to him and not to the American fighter. They're saying, annihilate the black man. From the fourth round on, Lewis didn't know where he was until the twelfth, and, and everybody knew where he was on the floor, being picked up with a blotter. He has puffed up Lewis's left cheek, and Lewis is down. Lewis is down, hanging to the rope, hanging badly. He is a very tired... When my father lost to Max Schmeling in 1936, uh, I think the hopes of black America uh, were severely drained. My mother said that at the end of that fight, 1936, that my father was devastated. Uh, that without question, uh, Joe Lewis felt that he had let uh, millions of Americans down, his family down, etc., because it was not a fight that he should have lost. Lewis is down! Lewis is down! Hanging badly! He is a very tired fighter! He is blinking his eyes, shaking his head! The count is done! The fight is over! Fresh from America with Max Schmeling. Blonde film star Anna Andre is on hand to welcome her celebrated husband, fresh from his triumph over Joe Lewis. Annie heard America's plaudits by radio. But the reception Max is getting today is the most amazing in his career. Schmeling's victory meant that the German boxer would be next in line to fight reigning champion Jimmy Braddock for the heavyweight title. But while Germany was busy hailing Max Schmeling as its national hero, behind his back, the Lewis camp had managed to get their man the title fight with Braddock. He got the shot of the title because of the forces in this country were very nervous that the heavyweight champion of the world be a German. In 1937, as a stunned Max Schmeling looked on, Joe Lewis finally got his shot at the heavyweight title. In the eighth round, Joe Lewis knocked Jimmy Braddock to the canvas with a devastating right, and black America held its breath. It has been a long 22 years since Jack Johnson, but again a black man, is the heavyweight champion of the world. In Joe Lewis, black America had finally found a man capable of fighting for the heavyweight title. And in 1937, he became heavyweight champion of the world. I remember speaking to my father, and um, while he was proud to be the heavyweight champion of the world, there was a serious cloud over that title, and that, uh, that cloud was Max Schmeling.
Joe Lewis still had something to prove and accepted a rematch with Max Schmeling at the earliest opportunity. The date was set for the 22nd of June, 1938. Brown bomber Joe Lewis puts the name on the dotted line that says he's all ready to defend his heavyweight crown against Maxi Schmelly. Smiling now, but just wait till June 22nd. The impending fight was not only important to the pride of Joe Lewis, by the summer of 1938, it had captured the attention of the world. Any doubts America might have had about the true nature of Adolf Hitler's Germany were quickly evaporating and whispers regarding the treatment of Jews and other minorities were growing louder. Hitler perceived that Max was going to be a valuable PR tool. Max meets not only Hitler, but Goebbels and Goering, the German Aryan who had already done his beating of the black man, was being put to a test again. What had started out as a personal grudge match had been caught up in a far larger international agenda. Joe Lewis goes to the White House on an invite from Franklin Roosevelt, who meets him, interestingly enough, not in the White House, but on the lawn, feels his muscles and says, we need these for democracy, Joe. Now, Lewis is fighting for America. Blacks, yes, but whites also. The heavyweight championship, which had once been a beacon of white supremacy, had come to symbolize the free world, and Joe Lewis had been cast as its unlikely champion. The defender of democracy for the first time in American history was a black man. Joe Lewis's second fight with Max Schmeling took on enormous symbolic importance. On the one hand, you had Max Schmeling, the Nazi Superman representing German fascism. On the other hand, you had Joe Lewis, the American representative of democracy, good versus evil. Hitler versus the free world. These are two world views. These people represent something so far bigger than themselves. As June of 1938 approached, both fighters found that they had stepped out of the realm of sport and onto the international stage. What was so ironic about the fact that Joe Lewis was America's representative in this clash of ideologies was that in many areas of the country, Joe Lewis if he went to the American South, he couldn't sit at a soda counter. He'd have to get to the back of the bus. He would have to use a separate washroom. And you know what? He wasn't probably going to be treated much better in the North either. If you were black in the 1930s, you were still a very much a second-class citizen. And so the fact that he was our representative against this fascist, racist regime was more than a bit ironic. With the attention of the world on him, Joe Lewis stayed calm and composed. Max Schmeling was also feeling the pressure. Max is going into this fight, not only the underdog, but the bad guy, where he had been um, the likable youngster in 1936 and done something incredible. Now he's being cast as evil, he's being cast as fascist, he's being cast as Nazi. If he loses, he's going to probably suffer. If he wins, he will become swallowed up in the racial politics of the Third Reich. The call June 22nd, 1938. Both men appear at the official weigh-in ceremony. 70,000 people pack New York's Yankee Stadium, but thanks to radio, another 70 million followed the build-up to the fight. Everyone, but everyone listened. It was a major event. This wasn't a fight of the century. This was a fight for the world. Despite the intense scrutiny he was under, Lewis remained focused. A man named Jimmy Cannon, excellent writer, is asked by Lewis how many rounds he thinks it'll go. And Jimmy says four. And Lewis, getting his hands wrapped, goes, While America tuned in, live German radio coverage also allowed the Third Reich to support their man Schmeling. The front heavyweight title holder, Pop Schmeling. As the two fighters waited for the start of round one, the world stopped. Some 30 years before the moon landings, this was the biggest event in broadcasting history. He 
walked in the ring and he waited in that corner, he waited in that corner, he came out and they got instructions and Joe never said a word. It was like he was a spring and somebody uncoiled it. And there we are. And they got to the ring right together with Arthur Dunham and Stepper Rang. From the very first seconds of the opening round, it was clear that Joe Lewis had learned his lesson not to drop his guard. Milling is not sitting around very much, but his face is already marked. And they stepped into a fast clinch. And at close range, Lewis fights desperately to bring up a left to the jaw and a right to the body. And coming out of that clinch, he got over a hard right and then stabbed. Soon, Lewis's relentless assault had Schmelling on the ropes. Lewis then dropped him with two straight lefts to the face and brought over that hard right to the head. High on the temple. And Max tied him up with a left swing, but in close, brought up a hard right over the and right to the jaw. And... It was like uh, an executioner with a victim strapped down. Schmeling was making noises. It was like a woman weeping. He was hurt so bad. The fourth castle said that night there wasn't a man alive that could have beat Joe. And Schmeling is down. Schmeling is down. The count is four. It's, and he's up. And Lewis, right and left to the head, a left to the jaw, a right to the head. And Donovan is watching carefully. Lewis measures him right to the body, a left up to the jaw, and Schmeling is down. The count is five. Five. Six. Everyone stopped to hear Colin McCarthy say he's down. He's down. Schmeling's down. The count is one, two, three, four. The men are in the ring. The fight is over on a technical knockout. Max Schmeling is beaten in one round. The first time that a world heavyweight championship ever changed hands in one round. The winner and still champion, the Lewis! In a brutal display lasting just two minutes and four seconds, Joe Lewis fought like never before for himself, his race, and his country. Max Schmeling threw just two punches. Okay, this is a blow against Hitler's Germany. This is a blow against the master race. This is a blow against, uh, against fascism. But, but for African Americans, you know, it's, it's so much bigger. I mean, this is where it's, it's joy. This is, this is where, yes, it's a blow against all these things, but it's a blow struck by an African-American. The streets just, 35th Street just became jammed. State Street became just jammed with people. They were stopping streetcars. At that time, a lot of whites came through the neighborhood, but was nobody, was nobody hurt. It was just, just reveling, everybody just reveling. There was little consolation in defeat for Max Schmeling. In those 124 seconds, Joe Lewis hit him enough times to put him in hospital for 10 weeks. Joe Lewis answers Uncle Sam's call to arms. What's your name, Joe? My name is Joe Lewis Barrow. For three years during the war, G.I. Joe toured the country on morale-boosting missions and agreed to fight benefit bouts for the Army and Navy relief funds to help injured soldiers and their families. As a black American icon, Joe also helped to recruit thousands of black soldiers into the war effort. Accustomed to following orders, Joe Lewis did exactly as he was told. Yeah. Turn around, come back again. <laughs> there had only ever been one black champion before Joe Lewis, and that was Jack Johnson, and he had been dispatched from the spotlight on a legal technicality. Despite his loyalty and patriotism, exactly the same thing was about to happen to Lewis. Crucially, Lewis had signed the fundraising checks which were made out to him over to the Army and Navy. But rather than honor him for his contribution to the war effort, the government decided to pursue him for tax evasion instead. After doing all of this litany of activities, you owe us money, and we want the money. And unfortunately for Lewis, the government was rather unbending on this and forced Lewis back in to fighting once again. Joe Lewis emerged from the war having held the heavyweight title for 12 years, the longest ever reigning champion. But by the time he was forced back into the ring to pay his tax bill, he was a spent force. In 1951, Lewis was 37 years old. Back in training, he was to face a young fighter who had grown up with Joe Lewis as his idol, 
His name was Rocky Marciano. Hello, boxing fans, wherever you may be, but especially to those in New England, I'm in good shape for this fight, and I hope I come through all right. Hold it there, Rocky. Hold it there. In recent years, Lewis has picked up a great deal of bulk in both his legs and his chest. He weighed in for this match with Marciano at 212 and three-quarter pounds. At the peak of his career... The once magnificent Lewis was now 10 years older and 10 years slower. Rocky Marciano was approaching the absolute peak of fighting fitness. Joe Lewis, balding and bulky, eagerly answers the bell. The big question tonight, can the ex-champion come back? He's the slight favorite. In the, the, the crowd that night in Madison Square Garden was a Joe Lewis crowd. They wanted Joe Lewis to win, and early on, Lewis gave them some hope that that might indeed happen. Lewis, working behind his left jab. Lewis was taller and had a longer reach than his opponent, but found it difficult to match the younger fighter's stamina. Orsiano would throw punches, and he would hit people just in the arms. They would block it in the arms. But by later, by the seventh, the eighth, ninth round, he would break so many blood vests. I mean, their, their arms would just be too sore to raise up. Here comes a hard left, right, left by Marciano. Working on After seven rounds of punishment, Lewis was tiring from the onslaught. And suddenly he became very old in the ring. And Marciano just kept the pressure on, and he kept coming, and he kept coming, and he kept coming. Marciano exerting more and more pressure as he moves in for the kill. By the time they went out to, for the eighth round, Marciano knew that he had him. A left, another left, crumples Lewis. A blazing right, and Lewis sails through the ropes. And the saddest thing in the world was to see Joe Lewis knocked through the ropes. As the crowd wept because the great hero had fallen. And it was almost, long live the king. The king is dead, long live the king. And the king in this case was Rocky Marciano. The very first person to console the fallen idol was Rocky Marciano. Marciano cried. And he cried because he had defeated his hero. And I think if Marciano could have controlled the fight, he would have rather gone the distance and had a decision. Uh, but to see Joe Lewis knocked out and he delivered that knockout, I think it hurt him. Because Marciano also grew up from humble beginnings. He understood where my father came from. So at the end of the day, I think Marciano didn't want to be the man to knock out Joe Lewis. On the 26th of October, 1951, the reign of Joe Lewis as undisputed heavyweight champion of the world came to an end. It was the last time that the great Joe Lewis would step into the ring. Even the man who had defeated him was heartbroken. Rocky Marciano was a very feeling man. He went into Lewis's dressing room to shake his hand and, and, and thank him for the chance and, and, and commiserate. And Joe just said, I know what it's like to win. And don't worry about it. You're now the winner. And he sort of passed on his scepter. Another larger battle was won that night in 1951. The Luis Marciano fight ended an era in which boxing had been dominated by an unhealthy preoccupation with race. It was a sign that America was finally about to leave the idea of racial segregation behind. That Joe Lewis and Rocky Marciano competed on equal terms was part of the legacy that Jack Johnson, the first black champion, had left behind. But where Jack Johnson had burned bridges behind him, Joe Lewis had built them. It was Joe Lewis who made boxing colorblind. It was Joe Lewis who made America look beyond black and white. I think about Johnson as being really important for black America. I think Lewis was more important for white America. I think the image that Lewis projected you know, somehow made that I word, integration, more palpable for America. You know, he, he was important to how we viewed African Americans. A character that white Americans could say, oh yes, I wouldn't mind having this man in my neighborhood. Joe Lewis transcended boxing. He was a hero for all time. Them that's not 
So the Bible said, and it still is new. We're off to the Middle East next here on UK TV History as Simcha Yakubovici uncovers treasures of the biblical world in the naked archaeologist. Later, it's great SAS missions, and then it's Fred Dibner's magnificent monuments. The first time that a world heavyweight championship ever changed hands in one round. Yes, his God is all.